clean tech is where I want to go. Mm-hmm. Uh, because of auto and auto component experience that I have, I said, look, the intersection of clean tech and auto is EV. I read a report that Norway has 93% of their vehicles electrified. Yeah. What is that number in India right now? Oh, it's a really small <laughs> India has shown remarkable commitment to electrification. Leasing is nothing new in India. Why should people lease EV assets? Leasing becomes especially effective in a market where there is huge technology evolution happening. Okay. Uh, and there's lesser understanding on the asset and there's a weaker ecosystem to help you run the assets, right? Okay. So if you think of it today for a fleet customer, it's almost terrifying to firstly choose the right asset. Hmm. Should retail investors even consider investing in this asset class right now? Look, you know, where there's risk, there's opportunity. Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of the Alt Investor Podcast, where we provide you with the knowledge you need to make informed decisions about alternative investments. I am your host, Yash Rungta. Today, we have a very special guest with us. This guest was the CEO of Cars24 India and now runs a company which is on a mission to accelerate India's transition to sustainable transportation. Via him, we will learn about the EV sector along with tips and tricks our guest uses to invest in EV assets. We'll also talk about retail investors participating in this sector. Please join me in welcoming Kunal Mundra, founder and CEO, Electrify Mobility. Kunal, delighted to have you here. Thank Thank you you so much for taking the time to shoot this. No, thank you for having me. So I'll directly get into this Kunal. Uh, Very simple, basic question. Who is Kunal Mundra? That's that's an interesting (laughs) question to start with. Um, So I think, you know, the... The best way I can think of it is uh, I love solving problems and Mm -hmm. I'm extremely curious and I love to learn. Mm -hmm. So I kind of combined all of these and over the last couple of decades um, have had a chance to do a bunch of very interesting things. Mm -hmm. Um, Been a consultant for quite a while, been in the private equity space, uh, been been a founder for an auto component company uh, and of course now Electrify. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I've also had the chance to run uh, pretty large companies as well as early stage companies. So I think I've somehow managed to get a mix of experiences uh, to satisfy my curiosity and desire to solve problems. Pretty interesting, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, as you've got plenty of opportunities and you have capitalized on them. Yeah. So pretty good. Yeah. And, you know, outside of work, this is all work. Outside of work, I'm an avid photographer. Wow. Um, love hitting the road, whether it's on two wheels or four. Clearly. <laughs> yeah. And um, I'm a father of two. Oh, wow. That's great. That's great. Uh, So what are you doing right now? What's Electrify Mobility? Perfect. So, you know, Electrify Mobility is is an interesting outcome. So around, you know, 15 months ago, I headed out to say, look, I want to build something in clean tech, Mm -hmm. right? Uh, It was an interesting phase in life. You know, when you, you sometimes think of it, you say, hey, you've worked for 20 years, but then you realize you've got 25, 30 more productive years in front of you. Sure. And at that point of time, I was trying to figure out what's a problem statement that I'd like to spend the next couple of decades working towards, okay. right? Uh, and I don't think there's anything more critical uh, than climate change. Right. Right. Uh, and as I picked that thread and I pulled on it to say, look, what can I do so that over the next couple of decades, I can do something meaningful in terms of a contribution towards kind of the world's journey towards net zero. Right? Decarbonization. Uh, and that's why I said, look, clean tech is where I want to go. Mm-hmm. Uh, because of auto and auto component experience that I have, I said, look, the intersection of clean tech and auto is EV. Mm. Right. Uh, and therefore, I said, look, EV is really the space where there are more than enough problems. Let's pick one and solve. Mm. Um, And I think that as we, as I got into it, serendipity happened. Mm. Nikhil and I started having a conversation and, uh, you know, Nikhil said, look, at Crip Invest, we've built the largest EV leasing portfolio. Sure. Um, But, you know, as we started discussing, we said, look, while it's the largest, if you look at the opportunity, it's huge. It's pick a number, you know, $50 billion, $100 billion, there are different numbers flying around. But the bottom line is that, if you just look at commercial alone, mm-hmm. um, we have close to 
I would say four, four, four to five million vehicles on the road. Right now? Right now. Okay. In the intra-city space alone. Is that uh, four-wheeler or two-wheeler? It's two-wheeler, three-wheelers, four-wheelers, four right? Everyone that's on the road addressing intra-city movement. Hmm. Um, clearly, India is kind of bought into the... They, India is committed to net zero and mm-hmm. has realized that sustainable transportation is a key driver for net zero in the longer term. It's one of the key building blocks. Mm-hmm. So we said, look, this is a great starting point. I work deeply in auto and auto component. We've got this great leasing portfolio. Sure. But if you really want to solve this, you know, 50 to $100 billion problem, you need to be able to marry both financing capabilities as well as asset management capabilities to truly unlock electrification mm-hmm. uh, and kind of the transition to sustainable transportation. Sure. So that's when we said we should start a new company and mm-hmm. that's when Electrify Mobility was born. Um, and at Electrify Mobility, our aim is very simple. Mm-hmm. What we do is we simplify India's transition to EV okay. in the commercial space, you know. So um, if you're a commercial fleet operator or you're a corporate that has large number of vehicles uh, on your own books, sure, we would help you choose the right asset. Mm-hmm. Uh, we would help you deploy the asset in the form of a lease. Uh, we'll give you, you know, services to ensure you get uptime. Uh, we have our own centers to refurbish and redeploy assets. And then we'd also give you access to an entire tech stack so you can make the most out of the interconnected nature of these vehicles today. Right? Got it. So it's kind of a full stack approach. It's almost EV transition in a box uh, for commercial. And of course, the idea is that I think as commercial electrifies, we will see the sort of infrastructure being built out, which mm-hmm. will then trigger retail adoption of EV. Got it. Uh, so as part of that entire journey, this is the problem that we're solving. Got it. And can we probably put some numbers behind it? So I read a report that Norway has 93% of their vehicles electrified. Yeah. What is that number in India right now? Oh, it's a really small. <laughs> so then yeah. the opportunity is yeah. huge. Look, I think the opportunity is huge because the number you're talking about is in low single digits. Right? Okay. We're a long, long way off. Uh, if you look at China, for example, China today is at 98% uh, really? transition. Uh, for the intra-city commercial space, right? So they've okay. really gone hammer and tongs after it. So we've got a long way to go. Um, and I think by, you know, as hopefully over the next, I'd say five to seven years, mm-hmm. we make our way to, uh, you know, 90% plus yeah. share of sustainable transportation. Is that achievable? BEV. Um, look, I think with most with such large transitions, is it achievable? I think yes. Okay. Whether it'll happen in three years, five years, seven years, or 12 years is anyone's guess. And I think what we have to do is work together because it requires an ecosystem build out, right? Which is why I I don't, I don't doubt that we will get there. Mm-hmm. But how soon will we get there is a function of how well the ecosystem can actually come together. Uh, because growth is determined by the weakest link in the ecosystem. Sure. So what are the different components in the ecosystem? So, you know, if you think of it very simply, you have the OEMs, okay. who are the guys who are trying to develop the right product. In so the OEMs company. are? So original equipment manufacturers. Got right? it. So they are the, the companies that will actually manufacture the EVs. right? Like That's, Bounce, Electric or Yeah, so Tata if, you're, if you're looking at two-wheelers, you'd have the more retail-oriented guys like, you know, Ola, Ola Aether, yeah. um, and Avida. If you looked at the more B2B guys, there's a huge range of over 100 different OEMs. Got it. Uh, but you mentioned some of the names, you know, Bounce, Quantum, Electrix. Yeah. Uh, there are a whole host of them. TBS is also present TBS, in both yeah. sectors. Uh, so that's the entire OEM space. And three wheel- wheelers as well, you have both traditional Piaggio, folks yeah. like Piaggio, Mahindra, Bajaj. You also have newer folks like, you know, Alti Green, OSM, Got Euler. Um, in four wheeler, of course, Tata. Tata. We have Citroen, uh, we have MG, which is very active. Uh, And then when you go beyond that, when you look at four-wheeler commercial vehicles, again, you have a mix of kind of new age OEMs, Mm -hmm. uh, as well as old traditional OEMs, such as, of course, Tata Aces EV variant. Got it. Uh, So that's one important component. Got it. The other component is the folks who actually operate the fleets. Got it. Right. Um, Which is fleet operators, which could be in India, as you know, 
India, like China, is massively fragmented. So mm. the number of mega fleets in intra-city are minuscule, right? Mm. Most of India's last mile deployment of commercial vehicles mm -hmm. is through la is through small local fleets mm -hmm. and what we call DCOs, driver come owners. Okay. Right. Um, the third part of this component is, of course, very importantly, the financiers. Okay. Right. Where you have a you have the traditional financiers as well as the, the kind of new age financiers. Mm. And then you have service providers, right? Folks who will ensure uptime, uh, who manage your assets for you. Got it. So I'd say these are kind of the four leading elements of the ecosystem. Mm. Uh, Electrify kind of sits in the middle, Correct. saying that we will help uh, the fleet customers who are operating the assets. Mm. We'll help you find the right assets. We'll give you leasing solutions for it. We'll manage uptime for you. Uh, so we kind of are trying to stitch it together into a full stack solution for the end consumer. Got it. And you mentioned that to reach a 90% number, there are of course certain hurdles yeah. the ecosystem needs to develop. Yeah. What is the government doing about it? So, you know, I think it's, this is an interesting uh, choice for any government to make, right? Mm -hmm. How much do you support it and how long do you support it, right? Mm. I think India has shown remarkable commitment to electrification, okay. right? Between FAME 1, 2 uh, and the current schemes that's running. Yeah. There's been kind of consistent support. Uh, there's also been support on the manufacturing side when you look at battery technologies. Uh, there's also been a thrust where along with the support is a pressure mm. to electrify under the Shunya program. So I think the government has done a lot to drive this. It's not an easy decision to make. Mm. Um, if you give subsidies for too long, you create a, you create a crutch yeah. for the organization, uh, for the entire ecosystem where you know, there is no incentive to value engineer because someone else is subsidizing your cost. Right? Got it. Uh, but if you pull out support too early, mm. um, it becomes extremely hard and maybe the ecosystem isn't ready. I think there's no right or wrong answer, but I think what the government, the one thing that the government could really work towards is actually giving more predictability. Because mm. I think like, for example, today, um, we know we'll get support. The ecosystem knows the government is very pro-electrification, but everyone's kind of holding their breath to see what does this mean. Mm. Uh, so I think what would be extremely beneficial for the ecosystem is just a bit more predictability and a greater Got line it. of sight to which direction this is going. Uh, I'm hoping this time's budget will give that clarity to all of us. Got it. So, I'll shift gears a bit uh, because uh, uh, probably the audience seeing this is yeah. uh, there are tons of retail investors who are very interested in this space from an investment point of view. Okay. And uh, that will in a way benefit the ecosystem because you said there is a key component of financiers Absolutely. coming into the picture. Yeah. Leasing is nothing new in India. Yeah. Uh, leasing of vehicles or trucks happen all the time. Yeah. Why should people lease EV assets? Like, yeah. What is the good part about leasing an electric vehicle uh, as compared to, let's say, an ICE vehicle? Yeah. So, you know, I think, uh, so like you said, leasing has always been there. Sure. Um, the Indian commercial fleets have always been small with limited balance sheets. And therefore, they've looked at leasing as a great solution for them to scale mm. uh, over time, right? Even if their balance sheet can't support it beyond a point. It's, so it's been a great unlock for us, right? I think the big difference is that leasing becomes especially effective mm -hmm. in a market where there is huge technology evolution happening. Okay. Uh, and there's lesser understanding on the asset and there's a weaker ecosystem to help you run the assets, right? Okay. So if you think of it today for a fleet customer, it's almost terrifying to firstly choose the right asset. Mm. There are 100 two-wheeler OEMs. There are 300 three-wheeler OEMs. Oh. Um, there are new products being launched every day. Mm. Uh, and if you're a fleet customer, you're sitting there saying, look, I don't know which is the right, the right asset, right? Mm. In ICE, it's played out long enough. If you're going to do four-wheeler LCV at a one-ton range, you know, ki band karo, go get a Tata Ace. Yep. Economics are all beautifully set. Everything plays out, right? So you're not very clear on which asset to take in a market which is evolving so fast, mm. right? Second challenge is that even if you chose the right asset, as you look to manage uptime on the asset, which is so critical for you as a commercial player, you don't have an ecosystem around you, mm. right? It's not like you can go to the neighborhood garage guy and say, 
my my two wheeler broke down fix it for me sure. he'll struggle yeah. he won't have the confidence he's never dealt with the electronics of a of an ev he does not know how to deal with the battery of an ev right mm. so you don't even have that ecosystem in place mm. so i think leasing is especially important in this space because of both these factors that you need someone who's the expert to help you choose the asset mm. you need that expert to actually help manage the uptime on the asset as well sure um, and if you're a financier instead of kind of directly financing the end consumer you'd rather go via a leasing player mm. simply because that allows you to separate the credit risk from the asset risk mm. if you're a traditional bank you understand credit risk you don't understand asset risk asset around risk. evs right so that's why i think leasing is a more dominant play mm. in this space and will continue to be very very important i'd say over the next at least a decade if not more mm. i heard a report that zomato wants to electrify its uh, fleet by 2027 or 2030 something like yeah. that right do you think they will also go via the leasing model or they'll because uh, they have their big balance sheet they'll invest in the products themselves look so this is where i think the you know the devil always lies in the details right so unfortunately while the end consumers which is the zomatos of the world are excited about electrification they don't keep assets on their balance sheet mm. so the person who actually has to pull the trigger mm. is a local fleet or a driver come owner got it uh, or a new age fleet who's operating their vehicles for zomato right? got it um and therefore they are the folks who really need to get comfort around the asset the economics around the asset and then pull the trigger and that's right? your target audience that's our target audience because and it's interesting i think so much has changed over 2 years hmm. now there is there's no debate on whether moving to ev is the right step 2 years ago that was the question that hmm. what is the economics will the tco play out i think now it's well established that there's a tco benefit of around 30 to 35 so what's tco total cost of ownership right total because ownership. while everyone's excited about the lower running cost of an ev sure um you do pay a slightly higher f- amount up yep. front you have to factor that in and then look at the total cost of own- ownership over the lifetime of the vehicle sure that's now clearly positive in the minds of you know different ecosystem participants got it um but ultimately it's these smaller fleets that need to take the decision and of course the zomatos of the world uh and the swiggies of the world would will both put the pressure as well as give support in different shapes and forms mm. but the decision lies in the hands local of the, the thousands of local fleets that are out there in the market today got it so as electrify mobility what do you look in your credit risk assessment or as asset risk assessment whether to fund a local operator or not yeah so it's an interesting one look the first thing we do is you know like with most decisions if you get the upstream component right the rest of it flows from it right so, so getting the right component? asset asset right so we spend a lot of time figuring out whether we've got the right asset uh what's the how well does the asset fit into the use case uh what is the maturity of the design the production the supply part the spare part supply chain for the OEM uh how what sort of support will the OEM be able to give us i think that's a very very important first step in our mm. decision right because if we get the right asset that's kind of half the battle won got it uh, we spend a lot of time and effort on that now once you've got the right you've got the right uh, asset in place then you really look at the operator mm. and you know logistics is a is a tough business yep raise the thin margins it's not a business for the faint of heart mm. um and therefore we look we spend a lot of time to understand how well are their current businesses run okay uh, and some of these smaller fleets are exceptionally well run you know they've been running it for a few years they know how to extract profitability they understand the business at the most fundamental level got it right the only thing they don't understand is this new animal called ev mm. but they understand the dhanda really well mm. right so we spend a lot of time understanding how well is their current business run mm. and if you look at the contracts that they have will it support the new assets that they want to deploy right okay because again this is a sort of business where if i have 100 vehicles you you might be running a great business at 100 vehicles mm. but if tomorrow i give you 700 you'll go under yeah right so it's a mix of do you have the capability and experience and a strong business today and can you scale that up do you have the right contracts in place and the capabilities in place got it 
So you'll notice I didn't use the word balance sheet at any point yeah. because I think in a business like this, the traditional approach to credit underwriting doesn't play out okay. beyond the point. Got it. Sounds like a lot that you have to do in terms of your research. Uh, brings me to the question, should retail investors even consider investing in this asset class right now? Uh, given the yeah. mammoth research yeah. that they have to do if they go directly. Yeah. Look, firstly, you know, where there's risk, there's opportunity. Right? Sure. So I think I do agree that the EV landscape is a bit like the wild, wild west right yeah. now, right? Uh, but that's where the opportunity lies. So I would definitely say that, you know, it should have a place okay. uh, for any retail investor, whether he's looking at it from an equity point of view or a debt point of view. Okay. Right now, that I think is a given because otherwise, you know, high risk is high returns and yeah. this is where the returns are for you. Uh, and there are significant tailwinds to the entire industry as a whole. So it's kind of heading in the right direction. The right investments here could get you outsized returns in the future, mm -hmm. right? Um, I think the only thing retail investors need to do is to just make sure that they don't get carried away in the euphoria of you know, the headlines. Yeah. Like with most things, the devil lies in the details. Mm. Um, they need to partner with the right advisors. They need to find the right deals mm. uh, and invest money. So mm. I at no point think that the complexity should scare investors. I mm. think the complexity should excite investors mm. because in complexity lies kind of opportunity for outsized returns. Got it. Would you, however, classify this sector as high risk? Uh, from an investment point of view for an ordinary retail investor? I would. Yes. I would, right? Because as depending on what play you invest in, mm. uh, there is a lot of churn in the ecosystem participants. Sure. Fleets will, some fleets will come and go. Some mm. um, financiers will make bets which might not play out. Some OEMs will come and go. Sure. Um, and as there's so much flux mm. in, the, in the ecosystem, I think it'll be hard to not characterize this Got it. as, you know, higher risk. Got it. So, okay, that makes complete sense. You've mentioned that it is better to go via a third party who has the right expertise yeah. to do that kind of due diligence. Has uh, Electrify Mobility taken any sort of retail capital to finance such things? Yes, we do. We do take retail capital and we have taken it. Okay. Uh, we take it through a securitized instrument, which okay. is rated and listed. Okay. Um, but yes, we do take. And I assume that's via your uh, existing partnership with the Grip, Grip itself. Yes. So that we take it off the Grip platform. So any any deal that we want to execute via retail investors sure. would, would be on the Grip platform. And then folks can participate via that using the SDI route. Got it. So it's regulated. It's regulated. Look, it's absolutely regulated. Uh, and look, this is where, again, it's not only regulated, it's listed and it's rated. Got it. Right. I think the rating is a good view for people to take. Uh, and I think it's important. Right? It is when, important. When people yes. look at it, um, it's not, you know, 16% versus 18% versus 14%. Sure. Uh, different deals that we have. Some of our counterparties are large, they're scaled. They'll be at a much better credit rating versus others. Right? Mm. Um, we do a lot of analysis to see even if they're a freshly funded company, what's the sort of runway that they have. Got it. All of that gets factored into the credit rating. So, you know, going back to the conversation we were having, should a retail investor put money into this space? Yes. Okay. But, you know, should you invest directly because your friend has a fleet and needs money for a couple mm. of EVs, don't do that, right? right? The game is unfortunately far right. more complex. Yeah. But like go on to Grip platform and you might say, hey, my appetite is triple B. Mm. You will find a couple of deals of triple B, go put your money in there. Sure. If you're a bit more aggressive and you're like, hey, it's double B and I have a positive outlook on the company and the industry, I'm happy to go a bit lower down the credit curve, go for it, right? Sure. So pick and choose depending on your own risk appetite. Got it. So do not invest directly with a local fleet operator. Oh, yeah. But uh, let's say the bigger names in the industry, maybe Blue Smart or, yeah. uh, you know, I think there's one more company called Race Energy. Got it. Uh, they have their Vault program. Blue Smart has their Assure program. Is it worth investing directly via those programs? Look, I think uh, it's an interesting choice that investors should look at. Okay. But do the research. Look, mm. I think. Uh, the one thing in this space that you should not fall, um, you, that you can trip over, is don't 
don't decide based on headlines. Headlines, okay. Right? If you are excited about a direct program from a from a funded company, sure. which you heard about, mm. double click, understand how they're doing, speak to a few people, and then then go direct. Yeah. If you like it, go for yeah, it. Yeah, if you like it, go for it. But do the work. Do the. I dish. think this is the space currently where you have to do the work. Got it. And you mentioned a lot of OEMs also go out of the picture. Uh, yeah. What happens to the fleets? So you know it depends, and you know uh, some fleets have struggled. To be very honest, right? right? It depends because the original OEMs, many of them used to just import from China, and even Got today. It. There are a bunch of them who just import assets from China. Mm -hmm. uh, when they go out of business, you don't have the supply chain to get spare parts from China. Got it, right? Uh, so I think it really depends. Uh, certain cases, fleets have struggled mm -hmm. once the OEM has gone out of business. In certain cases, they've been able to figure it out uh, mm -hmm. and try to and been able to keep them up and running. Uh, we, for example, look very carefully at whether we can support the asset, irrespective of what market conditions are like right because even if the oems there it could be a little more expensive to do it through them i'd rather do it myself for an asset which is out of warranty period mm -hmm. so we look at some of those assessments so there are solutions to it it just requires a certain amount of hacks effort effort right? and, <laughs> and you know if you're a fleet operator i think the truth is if you're a fleet operator it's not like your life is a walk in the park right it's sure. a complex business with razor thin margins the last thing you want to do is pick one of these battles. Ki, you know, I picked the wrong asset. Got now it. I have to figure out how to keep them up and running. Uh, and that's where I think, you know, a full stack offering, it helps. Because then you're effectively saying, yeah, I understand the dhanda, I dhanda chala hmm. Asset is what I don't understand. There's someone else who's solving that problem for me. Got it. But from an investment point of view, or investor point of view, the good thing about these deals are that there is a, physical asset yes, in the background. Absolutely. So even if the OEMs go out of the picture, as long as the asset is good and yeah. you have clearly evaluated the asset risk, you will be protected to some extent. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Look, these assets will be refurbished, they'll be redeployed. Uh, the And this is where it becomes also, now this is the advantage, right? You've got a large market. Mm. Um, and as soon as you and you know, we've had cases where we've taken an asset which is actually off lease mm. and offered it to another customer post refurbishment. Uh, the fleet customers actually love it because they don't care. It's not a retail customer who's super sensitive Got it. to whether it's a new versus old. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you can refurbish and redeploy it, you're right. Absolutely. The fact is at the end of the day, it's an asset backed security. But I'm guessing the refurbishment, uh, the secondary sale of that asset will be at a very lower cost than the original price of the asset. Yeah, again, you know, if you go to sell it, yeah, you will get wiped out, right? Because look, when you go to sell an asset, huh. there is so much uncertainty. If today I came to you and I said, yellow EV, hmm. no, right? You'd be like, I don't know how to even assess the health of the battery. Exactly. You know, people have told me if the battery goes dead, this entire asset goes bad and then I'll have to put in a new battery, which I don't even know where to source it from. Got it. So I think today there is no public market for used cars, uh, for used EVs, used EVs, right? That will take a long, long time to develop. Mm -hmm. um, but I think there are still avenues to redeploy them to a commercial fleet. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, you know, what we've realized is if you, for example, lease it to a commercial fleet uh, with uptime guarantees, then there are a lot of takers for it. Mm -hmm. Uh, but if you just go to do an outright sale, you will mm. struggle. You will struggle. Because most people won't just buy it from you. Got it. Uh, viewers yeah. do as well. Uh, to run the electric vehicles, we need electric charging stations. Yep. And uh, as far as my knowledge goes, I think the biggest charging operator right now is Geo BP yeah. Partnership. I yeah. think they have a massive hub in Gurgaon yeah. as well with 500 charging stations. How does that electric charging uh, station market work? What are the economics? Do you guys also fund it? Yeah. Uh, let's talk a bit about that. Yeah. So look, I think uh, with the charger market, it's a completely different asset class. Right? Okay. Uh, as you can imagine, the biggest driver for a charging station is how long can it be relevant? Exactly. Uh, and how much utilization can you get out of it? Yeah. Right. Now relevance is, and I and then I said, and I specifically use the word relevance because a life of a charger is actually very large. Yeah. Right. So if I had a charger, it could, it's ultimately, uh, it's an electronic and electrical piece of equipment, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, it's very modular, very repairable. 
and you could make it run for 10 years. Got it. Right? So the concern is not the longevity versus, for example, in a EV. in a in a mobile asset like EV, you worry about the longevity of the asset. Sure. I think here you worry less about it. You worry about the relevance, you know. So mm. for example, 3.3 kilowatt chargers have now now you have 60 watt, you've got 180, you've got over 200, yep. right? Um, and therefore relevance matters. So mm. for example, if it's a 60 watt DC charger, it's going to be relevant for quite a while in the India ecosystem. Sure. But if it's a basic AC charger, mm. you would have to plan for kind of re redeploying it mm. in another spot over time. Because if that spot starts getting high traffic, mm. you might replace it with a 60 Fast. watt charger and yeah. move this somewhere else. Sure. Right? Um, the So one is just longevity and how, how relevant is the asset. Mm. The second one is utilization. right? Mm. And I think this is where... It's it's often a chicken and egg story. Sure. Uh, you need the charging infrastructure to drive adoption of EVs. Sure. But till EVs aren't adopted, people who are deploying assets are not getting the required utilization. Mm. That's where actually this commercial transition is very exciting in my mind. Okay. Because commercial look in most chargers, anywhere between like a I would say around a fifteen to twenty percent utilization level mm. actually gets you to break even. Really, fifteen yeah. to twenty percent. Fifteen to twenty percent utilization. So if you can actually, if commercial in India can create that base load for chargers, mm -hmm. that would be a huge unlock. Mm -hmm. Because then retail consumers like you and I can be served on an incremental capacity basis, mm -hmm. which is very exciting. So I think commercial will drive this. This will kind of cautiously go hand in hand. Um, and yes, we do fund it. We do fund uh, chargers as well. So we work with CPOs, okay. uh, charge point operators. Okay. And we would lease... Uh, a charger to them, mm. which then they would deploy and manage on the ground. Okay. Just for the benefit of, of our viewers, DC charging is fast charging. So your four wheeler can get charged within an hour or two. AC charging is slow charging. Yeah. So it will take close to six hours, seven hours if it's a 7.2 kilowatt yeah. charger and close to 13, 14 hours if it's a 3.3 kilowatt yeah. charger. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> because uh, yeah, a lot yeah. of people might not be aware. Uh, but uh, will we see an asset-backed uh, charging station deal anytime soon for retail investors? Yeah, I, there's there's one in the offing. So we'll oh, really? Hopefully, we'll hopefully have one soon enough. Oh, nice. So what's the average tenure of these deals? Because like you said, charging stations are 10-year yeah. product as compared to EVs, yeah. which might be 4-5 or year product. Yeah. You know, I think uh, most of the tenures continue to be around the 3-year mark. Years? Okay. No, three, I'd say 3-4 three to four year mark. Got it. Um, because I think given the life of the asset is long, mm. um, I think most CPOs are also careful about not locking themselves into too large a tenure at too Got high it. an interest rate. So I think, you know, a three to four year tenure is what we've seen in the market. I think that works well for all parties. I think mm. it'll work well for retail investors. Mm. I think anything over three to four years is, is I think, longer than what retail investors yeah, would yeah, be yeah. interested in. Yeah. Uh, and it works well for the CPOs as well. It works for financing partners on the back end as well. Got it. But I, I guess the institutional players might want a bit longer, right? For yeah. predictability. Yeah. They would, They would. the larger guys would want it for longer. Sure. But then I think they look at it more from a balance sheet hmm. management perspective rather than a specific yeah, 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 yeah. set of assets. So Got it. there are a set of players who will look at the funding problem very differently. Got it. Okay. So EVs and electric charges yeah. both of which you are already yeah. doing. Any plans to go beyond EVs? So, you know, so firstly, if you, the way it is, we look at the problem statement. Uh, EV is a means to an end, right? Okay. The key problem statement is how do we get sustainable transportation? Mm -hmm. So one of the things, because we have uh, deep engineering capabilities, is we're very excited about new technology. Mm. Right? So we keep tracking, for example, within EVs, the new battery schemes. So sodium ion batteries are coming out. Yes. We are now actually exploring those to understand how quickly can we get those to the market. Right. Wow. Similarly, we're excited about non-EV sustainable transportation options that will come in. And I suspect over the next three to five years, more of those will come in. Hybrid is a simple example sure. of where it's kind of you're marrying the old and the new technology to create a great outcome. Um, Hydrogen? Hydrogen, I think, you know, um, for intra-city is quite some distance sure. away. You know, I, I think when it comes to technology, 
I forgot who it was, but it's a saying that I always remember that we overestimate the impact mm. in the short term mm. and we underestimate the impact in the longer term, right? Mm. So I don't think hydrogen will change our life in the next three to five years. Sure. Uh, I think the longer frame, uh, you know, if you look at it over a decade, especially for intercity, mm. um, I think it holds a lot of potential. It'll mm. be interesting to see how it plays out. As soon as it's there's a viable play, we're going to jump in and participate in that as well. Sure. Um, but I think for intra-city, hydrogen might struggle to be the answer, mm. to be very honest. Got it. Um, okay, so my last question, uh, again from a retail investor's point of view, if they want to participate in this asset class, yeah. is equity participation the right answer for them or debt-based participation? Oh, that's a very interesting. Look, I think whether it's equity or debt is a function of what your own personal investment sure. goals are, right? I think... You should look at EVs as a category in both of those. So if you, you'll have a part of your portfolio that will be equity allocation. Mm. You should think about what are the longer term bets you want to make there. Sure. And kind of look at those over a 5 to 10 year horizon. Mm. Uh, and then in the shorter term, you'll have money that you want to deploy in debt. Mm. Uh, where there are again, kind of higher High ROI returns, options yeah. in the EV space. So I'd say in both of those, mm. um, you should definitely look at it. There are enough and more opportunities. So what are the good deals in the equity space, Kunal? Oh, <laughs> no, no, no. no. I, I, I would say, so I'm the last person you should ask in that sense uh, because my approach to investing is, is on the equity side is very simple. So I won't have any recommendation. What's your approach? Oh, my approach is very simple. Over time, you know, kind of tried my hands at all the, the funky options out there. At the end, I've realized that I don't have the time or the yeah. capability to do a better job than the professionals out there. Oh, wow. So I have gone down the mutual fund road um, and specifically even index funds, as simple as that. Because I think the India story mm. over the next couple of decades is so strong mm. that even if you did something as simple as put it in a bunch of mutual funds, mm. put some of it in just simple index funds, mm. you'll get the returns. And mm. it's actually played out far better than my own portfolio. Yeah, clearly destroyed more value. <laughs> so it's it's a very important message for all the retail investors watching yeah. them that as a finance professional like yourselves who is working actively in this industry, if you are not able to pay that attention and get the right deals, maybe you know the smaller guys will not be able to, or people yeah, with suboptimal yeah. knowledge might not yeah. be. And I think you know, and that's where it's a balance. So yeah. at least for me personally, I've come to a conclusion that in my equity, there's a part of it that goes in kind of the low involvement method sure. of mutual funds and index funds and then there's a portion mm. where i do want to take bets on bets, yeah. you know kind of back my knowledge back my point of view sure uh, and there's a portion and it's roughly i would say 80 20 um, which is 80 so 80 percent is actually kind of traditional which, you know it's not 80 i'd say it's 60 40 so okay. 60 percent is down the traditional low Got involvement it. route mm. that's kind of gets, gets me my base returns mm. 40% is where I will make more targeted bets. I will make some uh, private investments as sure. well in startups, in specific companies that I'm excited about. Sure. Uh, so I kind of maintain that balance. But you work with professionals to do that rest 40%? Um, not necessarily. Okay. I think out of that 40% also, there's around 15%, which is kind of... Just for the heck of it. Just, you know, just, you know... <laughs> Only by doing do you learn. Yeah, yeah. So it's my fifteen percent is my experimentation pool, sure, uh, which I know I can afford to make Makes mistakes sense. on. Yeah. Uh, the rest of my eighty-five percent is in far safer hands than my own. Got it. Uh, so that works out quite well. Makes sense. Okay, I learned a lot, Kunal. Thank you so much. I I think uh, EV as a space is very interesting. Yeah. I drive an EV car, so I personally I'm yeah. very bullish, uh, and I I actually live in Mumbai, so I see the charging infra popping up yeah. there very quickly as well. So clearly somebody is funding it. Yeah. Uh, there's a good opportunity for retail investors to fund it, which is very exciting yeah. as well. Uh, but the caveat is go via a professional who knows uh, what they are doing uh, rather than going direct. At least that's the takeaway for me. The yeah. investors can decide for yeah. themselves. But I learned a lot. Thank you so much. No, thank you for having me here. This is uh, very exciting. I think uh, it's, it's just a a really exciting time to be participating in this space, right? Whether it's as as investors or as ecosystem participants mm. in a different form, mm. uh, it's very promising. The next couple of decades will be very exciting. Mm. So hopefully everyone can make their returns from mm. it.
Thank you. Thank you guys for watching. If you're not part of the Alt Investor community, do join in. It's free. Uh, the link is in the description below. I hope you got to learn a lot more about the EV investment ecosystem in India and hope the talk also gave you an idea whether retail investors should participate in this space or not. Do like and share this video if you found the conversation useful and subscribe to our channel for regular updates. Thank you.